Hey Wood Turners, I'm Captain Eddie Castle and welcome to my shop. Finish one rotation on that cut. I did a video a while back about turning stuff on Late Zilla and I had a lot of requests for the plans from Late Zilla and you guys kind of told me you're shocked a little bit about the overall cost. About a thousand, pardon me, about a thousand dollars once you build it all up. Well, you're getting a machine that checked the market would compare to the six or eight thousand dollar machines are out there. It takes a little bit of work on your part to put it together. But today, oh and those plans are on my website if you're looking for them. Today I'm going to talk about just using acrylics. I mean if you can't make a rose like this, you can still make a clear cover. Yeah you can. And you can still inscribe somebody's name on the back side. You do it in reverse or detail a little bit and all, but first you have to be able to work with the acrylic. If you want to do that, you know the deal, you first have to watch. It's winter time in South Louisiana. It's early November and the temperatures dipped way down. I believe it will be in the 60s today. Man, I mean this is rough. Uh, it's hat. I had to put long pants on and all. Winter time. Now, let's talk about acrylic. I had several letters saying I was identifying it wrong. What I bought was cast acrylic. I found a couple of websites on the internet that sell it. But for a piece this size, they charge you about $15, $18. Then they charge you $24.95 to ship it. I'm sorry. $24.95, a guy should walk here from wherever this came from to hand it to me. Alright, then I went to eBay and I found a couple of sites. And you can find some acrylic. And this is nice product. This isn't the bulletproof Lexan that I was used to cutting before. But this is cutting pretty good. Now, I get three quarter, so I have some working if I, some working room, pardon me, if I use quarter inch, I'm right on the edge. If I use half inch, I got a little bit, but the dome isn't going to get that big. If I have three quarter, I got a whole lot of wiggle room. I mean a whole lot of wiggle room. I won't do that again, okay. But, that's why I like dealing with the three quarter and thicker stock. Now, I get it like this, and then I size it down to parts that I want to work with, like this. This is a little bit under three inches, I believe. Well, actually it's three and an eighth inches. How about that? But this is the size I determined that I need to start with in order to get the disc that I put in that face plate to engrave with Lazilla. But that's me. If you've got a larger bowl or a larger plate or a smaller one. I got a beautiful little one right here. Just thought about it today. This is a scrap of that pink plywood. I think I'm going to hollow this down. It's not that big. Look. It's about an inch and a half across. Hollow it down. Make a little dome lid. I have a scrap that will make this. But what do we do with it? Take it to a bandsaw and cut it down to size. If you don't have a bandsaw, you're really not going to get too much use out of this product. But take it to your friend's place and cut it on his bandsaw. Does not hurt. You don't need any special blades. But if you cut it with a timber blade, it's going to crack. I'm talking timber blade. Don't go anything too heavy. I mean, that's probably a 6, 3, 8, 6 point. Cuts it awesome. If you use a super fine blade, you're going to melt it out the way and it's going to re re-solidify behind it and then you'll be cracking the drops off. I go through all that. Cut it one time with the right blade. Now, after you get that, you have to put it on a lathe. That's what we do now. Putting it on a lathe, we're going to use double stick tape. I'm going to remove the, pla the paper from the plastic. I'm not going to clean it or anything else. It's clean enough. Just going to keep the dust and the grit away from it for a few moments. 
Now, I'm going to use some double stick sure tape. And I did find out that this is available online through eBay. And I'm working on a better identification so you can find it there. But the nice folks at Sure Tape said, even though Lowe's has made the mistake of not handling their product, it's it's available on. I'm did I say eBay? I meant to say Amazon. So we use the double stick Sure Tape. I love this stuff. It's good and heavy, good and thick. I put two strips on it just like that. Way overkill. But I don't want it to move on the first move. Then I take my utility knife, or my X-Acto knife, and I work on that little scrap of plywood. So I don't cut through the tabletop and the cover and everything else. I remove all the scrap. Now this piece is ready to mount. Let's go to the lathe. If you're a regular around here, you do know that I like my glue blocks because they make the machine so much more versatile. This is a special glue block, special in that it's got a, a depression in it just like all the rest. This surface is dead flat across here. But you see this groove? This is a take it off a groove. You'll understand later when we go to take it off why we have a take it off a groove. If you don't have that, you're gonna fight it a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. I do have the center mark. You see it? All right. And I just tap and not to peel that side off, otherwise I'd be marking it again or getting really close. I'll pull back the the blue the blue cover off the double stick tape. Now, this is going to go on here like this. You see all the surface area I have? That's all I'm going to make contact with, and you'll understand later why that's a whole lot of surface there to make contact with the Sure Brand tape. And if you found a better product, I'd like to know about it. Now, I did that. I held it up against my center and then pushed it onto the, t into the block so that it would be centered. Now, look at that. I'm running pretty true. Now, the critical part about this whole operation, I'm going in to get a sandwich because it has to cure for about 20 minutes, just like that. Time has passed. It's been about a half an hour or so. I had some things to, to do around the shop. I wanted to cut some more scraps and finish up that piece of hand. Well, you know, that in the sandwich. All right. It's on here. We're going to true it up. This is a step to where I most likely will knock it off the glue block if I don't follow my very first rule and that is to be a good sandwich no I mean that is to turn between centers I'm gonna keep my live my tail stock up against it just to keep pressure on it and keep it centered then I'm gonna turn up at about 2000 RPMs I'm still not true so I'm still gonna get the bump 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 but at 2000 RPMs I'm gonna get a bump 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 rather than a heavy hit eighteen millimeter round cutter on a half inch bar why? Because it scrapes a whole lot better than making cuts. These things will drive you crazy. You know, these Very low humidity. This is what we're going to get today. Nope, not quite yet.
this is when you make the outside diameter, the one you want to use when you get done. If you do, if you do not have round carbide cutters like this, or are into carbide, let's go to a regular 3 8 inch Ellsworth, roll it way over like a closed grind, like a shear scrape, and that will take it off. Now, I'm not going to show you this, but if you open up the grind and start across, there's a good chance you'll get a little bit more of an increased cut, but there's a good chance you'll get some fracturing and breaking. So let's keep it closed up and use it like the scraper. And don't get too aggressive on it, and don't hover in one spot too long, because you'll heat up the surface and you'll start getting some knotting and some curling. And you don't want that to happen. Now these are pretty much harmless. There's no strength to them in this type of plastic, so they're not going to reach out and grab your fingers. Let's say that that's the size we want for the lid. Mainly we got to set it because I haven't turned the bottom yet. We're a little safer now to pull the tailstock back and get it out the way. Mainly because the rest of our cuts were going to be essentially on the face and across the face and we're all going to be turning on smooth surfaces. Smooth surfaces. Um, they're true to the spin of the lathe and they will have less vibration, less chatter, and less of a chance to have the tool dig in. That's what I'm talking about smooth surfaces. This now goes away. Now if you have any of this product and it sits in the sun too long, this is what you'll be looking at. It will the, 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 the film will stick to it. Now we could easily just scrape this off, but it's going to peel away um, once you don't get the plastic when you start peeling you'll delaminate the paper and then it's just a little bit of a pain. Alright now there's the plastic coming off. As you can see what I'm holding on let me get you in here. You see that line right there? That's the only contact I'm making on that tape. Right there. Nothing else is holding. But, that's good enough. If I cut right. I'm going to go ahead and put, make this the bottom. Because that's the one you start with, the bottom. And I'm going to make it to the dimension that I want for the finished piece. And to do that, I'm going to use this little 5 16 inch detail tool. And I'm going to stay at the main speed. And I'm going to move you so you get a better look. We are back at the rate at the increased speed of 2,000 RPMs. You see that? We're going to take a little bitty bitty bite. See how it knots up? That's when it's melting off or scraping off. If I try to take an eighth, then I could get too much edge into contact and spin it off or break it or do that fracturing thing. So I'm going to figure that I need this to go into the into the jar about um, three sixteenths or so of an inch deep. And I want the lid to overhang the edges by about the same dimension. And I'm cleaning it up really well with scrapes. See if I can get you in a little bit closer so you can see that. You can see just how clean we're making that. Okay, removed as many of the cuts as we and marks on the cuts just by rolling the blade in there 
slowly up on the edge. That clears it there. Clears up most of the scratches on the sides there. This surface is flat, and except for that little dimple right there, it's in really good shape. But I have found that this does not really lend itself to good optics when you're looking through the lid. So you can play with either convex or concave, and it changes things a little bit. Choose to do that, you're going to scrape this out. To scrape this out, I'm going to again use my 18 millimeter round. There's nothing magic about this, except the price, because I have them cheaper than anybody else on the entire planet. But I will put it up there and do some light poles. Now, you see how I relieved the back surface of mine? You get a bar like this, relieve it, soften it up, so you can move it around a little bit. So you see I'm dishing it out slightly. Again, if you don't have this particular tool, let me give you a couple options. Number one, I'm going to raise the tool rest back up a little bit. We're going to go in here with our 3 8 inch gouge again, rolled way up on the shoulder. not so familiar with that tool, let's get familiar with cheap. This is my favorite uh, scraper. One inch wide, round nose, made by none other than the world famous Craftsman. This has got to be good. I mean, it was taught up right. Brought up right. Not a lot of pressure. If you're in a hurry, you need to take big, big cuts, go find something else to turn. This ain't going to work for you. You rush it, you'll heat it up, and you'll crack it. Watch that center. I'm going low. Coming up, coming across. Going low, coming up, and coming across. Why? I don't want to leave a, ra a, ra a raise in that center, and I don't want to divot it. Isn't it something how golfers took that term divot and made it some work with something in the golf world? Amazing. I'll get this done in par, too. Now, this was just a standard scraper. I rolled that nose down a little bit, and I grind it upside down on my grinder to pull that corner around. Now, occasionally I'll use a burnisher and just roll it up and push it up a little bit. Oh, I talk about something you might not be familiar with. This is a burnisher. This one comes from Lee Valley Veritas, and these are really nice. These are hardened pins up here. And they're, they're slightly tapered, you see? And the push-off pin is this one right here. Right? What I'm going to do is roll off this pin and, and curl against this one or this one. Just like this. Put it down. Oh, I'm getting the camera again. Put it down and pull it around. And that's going to force the ridge up on that 
burnish it on that scraper. It's going to force a better wire, where I'm at, a better wire right here to work with. Now, a couple of things. Your scraper's got to be sharpened at a, enough of an angle to where the, you get it at, that front tip makes contact with that pin. If you have, if it's so thick it won't make contact with the pin, you're rubbing on this, on this bottom shoulder down here. Or someplace where you you don't have it sharpened, it won't do you any good. But this will give you more cuts between grindings without removing metal. Isn't that nice? A sharp tool and no removing of metal. Stop the presses. We got the night story. Burnishers are a great way to put a touch up on edge on a piece. Gonna go back to it. Now, another way to make a cut or cut better is to make sure you're proud of the center. If you're below the center, you're not going to do very well. Got some little light spots up in here. You want to feel them out, make sure there's no divots in there. Ah, now we're going to sand this a little bit. As far as sanding goes, I'm going to change the light a little bit and see if I can get something to help a little bit. Alright, I brought the speed back down. We're at about 500 RPMs. And a critical item is to keep the material from burning or curling under you. So if you start with 400 grit, do you see any ridges showing up? And I'm going to have to turn off some lights. And turn down another light. There you are. See if I can adjust some lights so maybe you can see it a little bit better. Alright. Now, when I sanded it, you can see I got a couple of ridges showing up. If I can't make those go away real quickly, then I need to cut them out. Because I don't want to go to heavier paper and mess up the, the, the uh, material. Now, another key element is right here. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Mix it completely. Oh wait, it's just water. H2O. Alright. Like how I snuck in that chemical thing to make it seem like this is really really technical okay with the 400 I'm going to clear that whole surface and I'm going to make sure I got no ridges or dips or grooves or anything else in it all right and it's important that you clear the whole surface and do it then wash all the material off because there might be some pieces hiding in there that you don't want to rub into the next coat. I also washed the paper a little bit. I'm going to go up to these edges just a little bit because I know they're fairly clear. Just going to rub them so they're all uniform. Now that was 400. And this is silicone carbide paper. I get it from Vince Wojcik at Vince's Wooden Wonders. I'm going to go to my 600. And essentially, this is what we're going to do to clear this piece. All right. I'm going to do 600. I'm going to keep it wet. Now, if you're afraid of getting your lathe wet, get you some saran wrap. And wrap up the bed below this. Or a big piece of aluminum foil. The ways of your bed, the bed, the bed of your lathe, water's not going to hurt it. Hell, water's in the air. All you do is take a few minutes to either precondition it by spraying some water displacement compound formula number 40. That's a technical product available at most Home Depot's Lowe's and almost anywhere else in the world called WD-40. We're going to go to 800. 
And guess what, boys and girls? We're going to go 1,000, 12, 15, and 2,000 before it's all over with. Same routine. And we're going to keep it wet all the time. Can you do it dry? Certainly you can. Don't curl, don't boil, and don't overheat the plastic. We have sanded it, and as you can see, it's fairly transparent. See it? But it's still kind of cloudy. So we clean it up. I like to polish out with a product I get at AutoZone called Plastics by Maguars. Um, this is great for clearing headlights, polishing uh, the screen on your motorcycle, um, stuff like that. But really, it works good for this. Right now, we're done sanding. And as you can see, we're translucent, but not totally transparent. Um, so, we're going to polish it out. I like to use this product. It's Maguire's Plastex. It's available at AutoZone. Uh, you can see this. Look, look, for, look for something soft enough, hard enough, brittle enough, but got a smooth texture that would clear headlights. Because you're essentially working with the same product. I'm, this is rule nine. The only thing that comes to my lathe are paper towels and tissue. Never a rag. That thing says apply on a rag. Ignore it. Put it on a paper towel. Speed is still 500 RPMs. And I have it on a paper towel. And I'm going to work it in. Roll it around. And it's amazing what this will do in just a minute or so. And it will clear this up. Remove those little bitty bitty micro scratches. Don't forget to clear the edge and the other edge. Now, I'm going to bring the camera to show you that tape on the back. And that ring. Remember that? Didn't we see this a little while ago? That's where it's bonding at, and all the rest of this is just tape sitting on the plastic. That's the only place I'm making contact. Is a little one quarter inch edge all the way around, but it is dead smooth, no scratches, very, very transparent. It's amazing what a little bit of polish will do for it. Do not bring the speed way up because you'll curdle the finish. It'll wrinkle on you because of the heat. You don't need a lot of heat. You don't need a lot of speed. I just did it at 500 RPMs. Really looks good. It's clean. I don't wax it or put any other finish on it. It's time to flip around and put it in a jam chuck so we can do the top. Essentially the same move. Remember that groove? See that line right there? And I told you that was my taker router. To get it off this piece of double stick tape off that face plate, you need this because it really does hold. I had that cut wrong and had a high point but all that was being held on a quarter inch ring. See it? This goes away and the next we're going to put it in a jam chuck. We might add a little double stick just for safety's sake. Boy, this stuff does hold. Man, does it hold. Nice and clear. Nice and clear. Turning it around. This is a jam chuck. Almost right. This is just a glue block. And if you can see, there's a ridge. See the ridge right there? Well, that ridge is what this is going to fit into. Now, I turned something earlier today, and it's close to the right dimension. But we're going to have to fine tune this to get it right. We're going to fine tune it at probably about 1500, 1800 RPMs. And we're just going to true up this inside edge. And get this to drop in there. Right on the money. Now, for safety's sake, 
And you can see I've done it a couple of times before. I'm going to put double stick tape on this edge. I'm going to clean this edge up a little bit with a simple uh, scraping move and then I'm going to apply some double stick. I know I'm going to be putting good tape on dirty tape. I just put two strips of the double stick sure tape on here and I've heard from a couple of guys, Cap, you do know you can probably get away with four little tabs and stuff like that. Well, you know, if you put a certain amount of time into a project, you don't want it to give up because you are too chintzy to put six tabs of tape or a quarter inch rip of tape or a second padding or bring up the tailstock or something like that. You don't want that to happen. Well, I don't. It's your work. I don't really care, you know. But that's it. Now, I can go right to turning, or I'll bring up my soft touch, wait about 15 minutes, let this glue set up, glue set up that's on this double stick tape, and then go to work. And you notice the groove is here again? Yeah, the take it see off a groove is here again, so I can pry the piece off. Now, if you forget to do that groove, all is not lost. You don't have to call the guy down the street and tell him, oh man, you know what I didn't do? No, keep it to yourself. Do it next time. Next, this time, you just soak it in a little bit of uh, lacquer thinner, drizzle a little bit around it, and it'll come right off. Here's the bad news. When you put tape back over that lacquer thinner again, you got about a 50-50 chance it'll fail. So, but it's a way to get it off without setting fire to it, of course. Soft touch brought up. Put a little pressure. I'm going to go finish that pepperoni on rye. And then we'll come back to this. I waited about 15 minutes. Oh yeah, by the way. The pepperoni on whatever. You'd find my body out back later on. That kind of food would kill me. Alright, we now have a cut. Or jam chuck. And it's running fairly true. See it? And I have a face plate up again. The nose against it. Now, I don't need this any longer because... What I'm going to do is essentially some moderate scraping. Moderate, nothing too heavy, nothing too fancy, just some scraping. Now, I would tell you, I want to bring the speed to about 800. I would tell you just to roll over your gouge and get started on it. If you're saying, Cap, why don't you cut it? All right, why don't we just make a couple of cuts and I can show you what could happen. It could cut so nice, it's unbelievable. But that would just... get a true edge we can work with. This is uh, a detail gouge. Cut really nice. Good sharp edge. Not a lot of energy, not a lot of push, not a lot of heat being built up. Key is nice, slow, easy approach. Now, I think I managed to do what I wanted to tell you about. Do you see this? This is fracturing. This was a heat buildup by pushing a gouge, being a little bit aggressive, and I got this fracturing. Now, I'm very fortunate. This little bit of fracturing is not very deep. But if it was any deeper, any more, I would have to recut or abandon a piece, one of the two, in order to get past the fracturing. With scraping, you get the same thing if you get too aggressive on the scraping. But most of the time, you can you can 
eliminate this by taking softer, lighter cuts. Now, a good scrape will get rid of all that. No biggie. I'm going to go ahead and do some scraping on this and shape up the top of it. What I've done is used the 18 millimeter round. I'm trying to put my hand on it. There we go. 18 millimeter round and slowly gave this a nice arc. With the same caution, a flat spot, a rise, or a divot will distort the center. Remember to bring this edge down to about an eighth of an inch. You don't want it to be standing real tall on the piece. Or at least I wouldn't want it to be there. And then roll the piece out and feel for a bump. Now remember the deal we do with the pencil. If you haven't done it before, here it is. Roll your pencil around and you can feel a flat spot. Another flat spot. So I need to work on it. I got one right there. Right between those two points and I got one right here. And I need to work on those and get rid of them. Otherwise, they're going to catch your eye. When they catch your eye, it's going to detract from the finish. Feels better there. I still have a little ridge right up in here. feel for it. You find it, identify it, and go back and slowly take it out. We're almost there. Next step would be sanding. couple of notes here. Make sure the sandpaper is clean. I, I don't. What I mean is if there's grit or some residue on there from something else you've worked with or a flake of rust or whatever, it will scratch the glass and you have to go back and take it out. So before you get started with the piece of sandpaper, if it's been used on something else or you set it down on a table where it could have picked up a shred or a piece of trash, Get rid of it, change it, or clean it. Again, 400 and then 600. I, th I like the water. The water bottle works really good. Because I'm sure I cleaned off all the trash that left from last time. Now you can do a dipping tank and dip this in a tank of water to sand it. But are you bringing back some trash that you don't want to have on the piece? Is there something floating in your dipping tank you may not want to uh, have on the piece you're turning? Yeah, like a scratch. Don't forget that edge. Okay. And we just keep moving right up the grits. Again, I'm going to go all the way through 2000. I'm going to revisit that dip tank thing for a moment. I've had, I've seen on Pen Turner's form where these guys have these little pads for doing acrylics. And they keep them in a little pan of water down here and they pick them up and go through the red, the blue, the green, the yellow, whatever. And they stay in their acrylics. Are they bringing back trash, scraps, residue? You never know. So, One of the world's greatest ornamental turners mentioned to me one time 
in a workshop that he wet sands everything he does and he has a teacup with water and the paper in it for 400, 600, 800, 1,000, whatever. He never crosses the water. So he makes sure he doesn't have any trash from an earlier sanding in there. A lot of effort for an awesome, awesome finish. As I was coming up on 2000 grit, I had to stop for a second and change out the 1500 because I'd laid it down on a lathe bed and it picked up some trash and every time I sprayed it with water it, it seemed to look like it went away but it, when I used it I felt a little bit of tracing of something. Now if anything I push against that is harder than the plexi it's going to damage the plexi. Again we're going to the Meguiar's plastics shine on a paper towel now I, again a container says right here small mount to a pad or towel cl terry cloth no no cloth that why why you got you bugging me on this okay why right now I do have a couple of edges that'll catch terry cloth out here. Let me show you something. See that notch? That notch will catch a piece of terry cloth. It'll catch a piece of paper towel too, but it'll tear off. All this stuff will grab a terry cloth towel. It'll grab a paper towel also, but it will tear off. That's why only paper towels or tissue come to the lathe. We're clearing it. No high speed, still at about 500 RPMs. But look at that. Wow. Well, I stopped the camera so you could get a close up. Look at that. I mean, I haven't done anything on the outside yet. That stuff is on the inside. It's moisture from spraying the water that got behind it. But that's how clear it is. You can see the grain, the details in there, and everything. This is a finished lid. Now I'm still playing with some ornamentation ideas of things you could do on the back side of the lid. Again, I just used this as a lever to pry it away from the double stick tape so it's easier to get it off. Now, that is, look, there is a certain degree of magnification. You know what's cool about this? I'll tell you in a minute. If you choose to put a final buff on this, beware of spinning uh, polishing wheels like the Beal wheel or something like that. Be, be aware of that. They may move with enough force that they can generate some heat and that heat will melt the plastic or destroy it to finish. Now get this, this is meltable plastic and I don't mean meltable with a cigarette lighter or a torch or whatever it's meltable with friction, just simple friction. So if you take it over to that buffer and you even with white diamond or something that's softer and you buff away, buff away, buff away and you build up the heat you'll wrinkle the plastic. You will move enough of the molecules to stack them in a different position. How about that? But you can do a little light buffing with the same Megular polish by hand. Hey, on that, when you get it off the machine, get a microfiber tile. Towel. Somebody's got to explain that microfiber stuff to me one day. Fiber's fiber. Okay. But here we have, whoa! Now that is, I got a grandson that would probably sit there all night long with whoa, 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 you know, look at it. Um, I got to say, this came out really good. Very good parabolic, 
on the front and nice dish in the back. There's really good magnification. The cool thing, okay, you make a little jar and you make it just the right depth. Yeah, all right. And then you get some of those cheap diamond earrings at Wally World. And you put them down in there, and when she looks at they look about that big. Really. But that's good for about as long as it takes you to get out the room. After that, you're on your freaking own. Because she's going to come after you. Probably with a knife, a gun, and a stick all at one time. Playing with Plexi. I'm going to play with it some more. I think I've got some embellishing ideas that will work on this. But all in all, it's a simple little project. You start with a chunk that you buy on the internet for a few bucks. But you know what? If you have a plastic distributor in your, in your neighborhood, in your hometown or whatever, most of them have a scrap box. Most of them do sell the scraps by the pound. So go in, look for some acrylic sheet, get you something and get turning. You know what's fun? When the shavings that you're making are plastic. Then you're plasticizing making shavings. All right. Well, I got my noise bag. Give me an alert. They got somebody walking by. I got to go check it out. She protects me. 25 pounds of pure viciousness. viciousness. Right, my little sweetheart? Yeah. You know, butt doing that. She doesn't have a tail butt doing that. All right. You take care. I'll see you soon. That came out nice. What turn is I'm Captain Eddie Castellan. I've got about 200 how do you do videos out there on YouTube and about a year's worth of Ustream projects out there. Because I like to teach, because I like to share what I can do and what I learn from you. There are guys send me ideas, tips, hints, programming notes, comments, correct my grammar. I'm South Louisiana High School. What do you want? Okay. But all this comes from you, the viewer. So if you've got an idea of something we should do here on making shavings, send it on to me. My email, right here. EddieCastle at Cox.net. And I'll be glad to add it to the list of things that I'm thinking about doing. And we'll have a little fun making shavings. And by the way, if you're looking for the best deal on carbide cutters, I'm right here. Eddie Castle and the cock. Well, no, not really. You really want to do this. Look at this website, www.eddiecastlin.com. Now, here's the deal. I've got all these carbide cutters, and I can't tell you I have a CIB or CI. J or CI5 or anything. I can't use those numbers because I don't have those cutters. What I do have are 100% direct knockoffs of those cutters made of high quality carbide at one half or less of the going price of those lettered things. I don't use codes. I can tell you straight up. If it's a 16 millimeter cutter, I can match it. An 18 millimeter cutter, I got it. 14 millimeter square, 15 millimeter radius square, a 10.7, a triangle, whatever. We've got them. Measure your cutter, check out my website, look for cutters only, and you'll find all the cutters we have. And if you don't have the bars and stuff to go along with it, go to products and services. It's a dinky website. Don't tell me about it. It's a dinky website. But that's all I've got. And when you call, there's only one person will answer the phone. Me. Because that's how small we are. I handle the phone. Management handles shipping. And Nia is in charge of security. If I can help you, be sure you call me. Here's a number. 504-715-0512. I'll talk to you about it. Take care. Be good.